Well, good afternoon. And as ever, one of the small little silver linings in the whole COVID pandemic is our ability here at FS Club to bring in people from all over the world that, frankly, we couldn't afford uh, to fly around or, or even pay. And I'm delighted to have today Professor Jeffrey West dialing in from Santa Fe and the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico in the United States. Uh, I was delighted to meet uh, Jeffrey some 20 years ago, courtesy of a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Robert Haircock, who has also appeared on several of our webinars. And what particularly struck me, and Jeffrey will be explaining this, but was how he pulled together so many strands in which I was interested, whether it was finance, the growth of cities, economies, life itself really, in the question of scale. And that's the title today, Scale, the Universal Laws of Life, Growth and Death in Organisms, Cities and Companies. Now, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zen, and it truly is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these fun, exciting, and I think intellectually challenging webinars. And we can only do so thanks to the generosity, and may I say tolerance of our sponsors who do allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today is certainly going to be one of those great days where I hope you're challenged as much as I was looking at the synthesis between all sorts of things. Now, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert, uh, but three points of housekeeping. Firstly, yes, there are slides, and yes, they are already posted, uh, and they'll be put in the uh, chat room for you. Uh, secondly, may I uh, ask you to please send in your comments and questions uh, via the GoToWebinar chat facility. I'm here with you, so I won't get your signals, your WhatsApps, your texts, your emails until after this is all over, but I would like to feed them into the conversation that we'll be having at about 25 past three, at London time, I should say, uh, with Jeffrey. And very, very finally, yes, there is a recording and it will be up in approximately two working days, so uh, pro probably either late tomorrow or first thing on Monday. But with no more ado, if I might say, Jeffrey, uh, as you say here, the floor is yours. I'm just going to change a uh, presenter to you right now, so you should hopefully have control. Okay, well, um, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Delighted to be participating in your series of lectures. Um, I'm, uh, you know, this talk is, uh, you know, the title is very grandiose, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to cover a, um, a very uh, broad range of uh, pr questions and problems. Um, so um, I'm going to begin by, uh, and it's going to be sort of impressionistic because I can't dig deep into most of these, but I'm going to begin with a kind of curious picture, which is my version of a photograph that I imagine would have been taken in the year I was born, 1940, um, of, uh, by a NASA satellite of the planet and compare it to what it looks like today. And what you see is a planet that's not just lit up, it's burnt up because literally you know what that is representing. That's uh, basically the lights fueled by fossil fuel um, uh, of, of cities and um, a proxy basically for socioeconomic activity and the extraordinary increase over a very short time period of uh, the kind of activity that's gone on the planet. And what I'm gonna be discussing is actually in this context and um, so just to give a, a sense of the scale of that, uh, if you just average this into mid-century, we're urbanizing at over a million and a half people every week, which is equivalent to adding an entire London every couple of months, or a Taunton or Oxford every day. I, I chose Taunton because I had to be born there. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and, and here it is a little more quantitatively, just again, sort of impression. So sort of any metric that you look at, either socioeconomic or, some kind of physical activity um, is increasing at this exponential, even faster than exponential rate. And it's been this, what has been termed this great acceleration, of course, stimulated from uh, the industrial revolution, the discovery and exploitation of fossil fuels and the uh, marvelous engine of entrepreneurship and capitalism. Um, uh, but uh, what, what becomes clear from this is the future of our planet is integrated strongly with the fate of our cities. And so there is an urgency to really understand the, the process of urbanization and what a city is. So developing a kind of science of cities, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So when you think of cities, 
this is sort of the image you have, the buildings, the infrastructure, the roads, etc. Uh, and of course, that is what a city is, but it's actually much more than that. And in fact, in some ways, this is the subdominant part because this is actually a stage, it's a facilitator of social interaction. And this is more what a city is really about. It's a place to induce more and more uh, social interactions, to encourage entrepreneurship, creation of ideas, innovation, wealth creation, and so on. And great cities have not just formal places to encourage that, like theaters and lecture halls and universities and, and uh, sports stadia, but it has informal places. Great cities have uh, places to gather, both uh, coffee houses and squares like this. And what you see is that this process of social interaction obviously manifested here, which uh, in the creation of ideas, almost all of which uh, in this instance are sort of irrelevant to everybody else, but the spirit of what's going on there is, is eventually produces remarkably a theory of relativity or the internet or a Microsoft or whatever. And that's the process of the city is the machine that we've invented to encourage that. So it's this extraordinary machine that has evolved in order to create wealth, knowledge, innovation, ideas, in order to increase standards and quality of life for all. And in that sense, it has been extraordinarily successful. And indeed, what we're doing now is, of course, one small manifestation of that. Uh, but of course, this comes at a heavy price. And that heavy price is because really uh, the most fundamental law of science, namely the second law of thermodynamics, which says if you create great order, which is what we're doing with this marvelous machine, we also inevitably create disorder. And that's called entropy. So we inevitably. Um, create something I've termed social entropy, which are things you will very quickly recognize, uh, namely um, things like uh, <laughs> that some of you may uh, be, be participating in as we speak almost, this kind of thing, the kind of traffic gridlock, the rush and speed of life, pollution, uh, 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 crime, uh, poverty, inequality, disease, pandemics, social unrest, and indeed, climate change. So um, uh, let's start talking a little bit about what a science of cities would mean. And uh, the first thing to recognize is that cities, and by the way, companies, which I will talk about um, in a few minutes, are what we call complex adaptive systems. They're highly complex. They're, they have multiple dynamics, multiple scales, lots of uh, participants, and they're continually evolving and adapting and crucially, at the biggest level, the largest, highest level, they're sort of the integration and tension between, on the one hand, their infrastructure, their physicality, their energy, their metabolism, um, with the information exchange in social networks, which is the phenomenon that produces this uh, wealth, innovation, ideas, and so on. And all of that happens through networks. Networks play this fundamental role the flows of energy and resources, the obvious ones of things that you're familiar with, uh, transportation networks supplied by energy networks, um, um, and, and some networks that we don't even appreciate are there in terms of their structure. And here's a, a curious picture of the flow of traffic out of Laredo, Texas, Texas uh, just arbitrarily chosen during one year. Uh, that is not a map of the roads in the United States. Um, what it is, is that flow, and it looks quite different than a map of the roads of the United States, but what you see is it has this kind of fractal river system-like uh, behavior, which of course is very reminiscent of what goes on in the insides of each one of us. In fact, it's quite similar. Uh, the only difference really being uh, that um, yeah, we are three-dimensional and this is two-dimensional, but biology is replete with such networks. It functions by those networks, and as many of which you're very familiar with like that, but your brain, the uh, networks between uh, the white and gray matter, the processing and the uh, computational part, and of course, plants and trees and so forth. So you're very familiar with that. But here's what's amazing, is that the, the general principles and the mathematics and geometry that govern these networks leads to extraordinary constraints on what might appear the arbitrariness and capriciousness of the world around us 
And the best manifestation of that is a famous law that's called Kleiber's law that's been known for a long time, which is for the most fundamental quantity of biology, and in fact, is the most fundamental quantity of any complex system. And that is its metabolic rate, how much energy is needed, how much food is needed per day to stay alive. And that's plotted on the, on the vertical axis against size, and um, it's plotted logarithmically, just simply meaning you are by factors of 10. So I can get a mouse and an elephant on the same graph. And what you see here is despite the fact that each one of these organisms has evolved by natural selection, each one has its unique history, each subsystem of it, each organ, each cell type, each genome has its own unique history, in which case you would have had this idea of this sort of random behavior, and these points would lie arbitrarily, so to speak, across the graph. Quite the contrary, they line up in some very regular systematic fashion, in fact, in a straight line, the simplest possible when plotted this way. Furthermore, the slope of that line is a very simple number, approximately three quarters, which is less than one, as illustrated here. That would be if it were linear, which means if you double the size of an organism, you would require twice the energy. No, this says that double the size of an organism, you only need, roughly speaking, 75% as much energy or food per day to stay alive. So there is built into this an extraordinary economy of scale, and that is all determined by the mathematics and derived from the, 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 the principles of network flows and network geometry. Um, it's not just metabolic rate, and it's not just these organisms, it's across the entire spectrum of life, from the smallest to the largest. And it's true for any physiological quantity, um, whether it's um, uh, or life history event, like how long you take to grow, how many children you have, and so on. And here's just a, a few examples. This is growth rate for plants. This, I, as you can see, covers 20 orders of magnitude. Here's your heart rate decreasing. By the way, the slope of this is also uh, roughly three quarters. The slope of this is minus three quarters, minus because it's decreasing with size. Um, and here's your brain, white to gray matter in your brain, following a beautiful straight line. And the slope of that is approximately five quarters. And here's something with much more variance, that's genome length. Um, and that has a slope very close to one quarter. And what you see is an extraordinary systematic pattern, as they say, has its origins in these network structures. And uh, not only that, they are the slopes of these lines are typically uh, a simple multiple of one quarter, and that is derivable from the theory. It is to do, in fact, with the dimensionality of space we live in and the optimization of these kinds of systems. Now we can take this, we now have a sort of theoretical framework, and we can apply it to many things. Uh, you can apply it to aging and mortality and growth and cancer and so on. I'm just going to do this growth one because growth works in the following way in this picture. You eat, you metabolize, that energy is sent through networks to the cells at the cellular level. Um, uh, it uh, does uh, rep repairs those that are damaged or replaces those that have died. It does maintenance and then it adds new ones. And by the way, this is the template for the growth of cities and the growth of companies, which I will show you in a little bit. And if you do that, you put that into the mathematics and you solve the equations, you get that nice solid line and there's data points and you get a, a wonderful agreement with data and you can do this universally for all organisms. But the crucial thing I want to emphasize here is that you automatically stop growing even though you go on eating um, because of the economy of scale built into the sublinear scaling derived from those network structures. And that leads automatically to bounded growth that scaling less than linearly uh, leads to um, uh, the cessation of growth. So the question, here's these sort of extraordinary hidden laws of biology. Um, uh, you don't see them. If I look out the window around me, it all looks like some arbitrary capricious mess, but underlying it is this extraordinary regularity. And if I had time, I'd show you 50 to 75 <laughs> other kinds of scaling laws covering biology. But I'm going to move into cities, ask are there hidden laws of cities? Well, not surprisingly, given that cities are also network structures, albeit in a slightly different way, they're two-dimensional after all, um, they too manifest um, uh, uh, systematic scaling laws. And here's a mundane one. This is petrol stations versus 
versus population size uh, plotted again logarithmically. And you see very good evidence of scaling, and this is for European countries. What is amazing, and what you see also is that it's like biology, it's less than linear. Uh, the only difference being the slope of these lines are approximately 0.85 rather than 0.75. So, um, but furthermore, that this is true for all infrastructure, not just petrol stations, length of roads, electrical lines, water lines, and so on. And it's true across the globe. You can look in Argentina, you can look in Australia, you can look in Albania, um, and you look in the United States, and you get basically uh, the same law. For all infrastructure, there's this extraordinary saving with every doubling of city size. But as I said at the very beginning, in a certain sense, this is the less interesting part of a city, even though it's the part we usually think about when we uh, say the word city. What is much more important and much more interesting is the socioeconomic activity in the city, and that's governed by social networks. Um, and these social networks have, um, uh, are, have to be integrated with and are in tension with the infrastructural networks, and that's sort of the way I've tried to illustrate with this graph. What's going on in the middle there, as I said earlier, is ideas are being created. A talks to B, B talks to C, C talks back to A, and there is this continuous feedback, and we build on each other. We build on, on the conversation. As I say, most of it is useless, pointless for everybody else, uh, but every once in a while, out comes Amazon. And uh, the reason for that is because we have positive feedback mechanisms in these social networks, and that leads to a completely different kind of scaling. It means that instead of the bigger you are, you need less per capita, an economy of scale. Uh, now, what because of this positive feedback, the bigger you are, you get more per capita coming from this continual enhancement as we, uh, uh, as we interact. And that leads to instead of sublinear scaling, slopes that are less than one, slopes that are bigger than one, and instead of the pace of life slowing, which I did not emphasize earlier in biology, big things, hearts beat slower, um, lives are longer, and so on. Um, in superlinear scaling, we have the pace of life automatically increasing because of this feedback mechanism. And here's data. And um, here's just a panel of, that I chose of just arbitrarily of six metrics, different metrics in different parts of the world, and you see they're quite different. There's uh, wages, then there's patents, that's ideas, uh, plotted in this same way uh, versus the size of the city, even restaurants and GDP, crime, and so on. Um, and what you see just by eye, they're all following the same scaling law. Why? Because even though they manifest themselves differently, they're all derived from the dynamics and geometry of social internet, uh, social networks. Um, and uh, uh, to put that into English, just make sure everybody's got it. Um, what this says, the good, bad, and the ugly all come together because if you double the size of a city in, within a given urban system, systematically, on the average, you save about 15% on all infrastructure. And at the same time, you gain 15% on all the good things, income, wealth, patents, education, creativity, so forth, um, but also on all the bad and ugly things like crime and disease and pandemics and so forth. And indeed, uh, much better during a pandemic to be in Taunton than to be in London, um, although much better to be in London than Taunton if you want to have a busy, exciting, creative life. Okay. So um, I just threw this in, uh, now back to that slide, that panel, but um, we can uh, test that and show that it's uh, connected to social interactions by looking at billions and billions of telephone calls, of mobile phone calls, and we did this with colleagues at MIT, and uh, what's plotted there on that forefront gra uh, graph is the social connectivity as analyzed from billions of uh, data on uh, mobile phone calls. And you can see just by eye again, the, and it's plotted versus the size of the city. And what you see is that it is just as predicted, as would be predicted, that it follows the same kind of 1.15 slope, 1.12 slope um, uh, of all the other socioeconomic quantities. And by the way, the two different colors there, one is Portugal and the other one is the United Kingdom. Okay, so one of the questions is, of course, uh, 
what happens uh, now that we're doing this soulless um, alien way of interacting uh, via the web like this it's terrible but anyway we're doing it but it's allowing us at least to interact but what effect is this going to have so that's one of the, the questions i'd like to poll the audience on whether you think some of uh, the the uh, the question of our sustainability of this is uh, is going to be by this kind of phenomenon Jeffrey, that's great wow you're packing so much in folks i've launched the poll um as ever uh, in fs club uh, people are voting very rapidly jeffrey so the question is will we be saved by please select one it and the internet big data ai and machine learning the cultural social revolution or none of the above none of the above we're all doomed uh jeffrey just oh, one quick thing while they're voting um could you uh just try and uh, restart your webcam again there's a little webcam button uh two oh. down from the arrow it seems to have just been lost for some reason Anyway, yeah. well over 80% of the audience voted. I'm closing that and sharing the, the results. And as you can see, uh, cultural and social revolution or we're all doomed seem to be dominating. Well, I'm, uh, I'm surprised because that's my feeling, by the way. I'm one of those ah. near the bottom. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, but I, I, I thought that, uh, uh, you know, this, this kind of audience might uh, buy for... Might <laughs> I, I interact, I, not so much in the last couple of years, I interact quite a bit with uh, Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley would, of course, uh, uh, it would be dominated by the top two or three of those. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, two quick uh, housekeeping things. We're, we're seeing your full slide deck again, if you don't Yeah, mind. I'm going to try to, uh, is that That's better? That's great, we're back to the question. And just that webcam, if you don't mind, there's a little webcam button. There's an orange arrow on the control panel and two down a little webcam. If you click on that, it'll restart. Oh, yeah, your yeah. How's that? That's great. We got you. Now we're back to the slides, but we got you, which is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How's that? Off you go. Thank you. Okay, good. So I want to talk about growth now of, um, first of all, of cities, and then I'll talk about companies. And it's kind of the same. It's the same template as uh, organismic growth. Um, that is, you have something you might call social metabolic rate, as distinct from your regular me metabolic rate, usually means how much food you can eat. But this is sort of everything that dumps into a city. And that again goes towards, it gets allocated on in the big picture between maintenance and growth. Maintenance, you repair all the buildings and roads, but you repair people. You have hospitals and doctors, and you grow new things, you including people. Um, uh, and so um, you put that into the mathematical framework, but now it's driven by something super linear rather than sublinear. And uh, very satisfactorily, you discover that super linear scaling leads to super linear growth. And that's what this is. In fact, super exponential growth um, because faster than exponential, which is what we see. So the theory is very self consistent and very predictive. And that's great. And it leads to unbounded growth, unlike uh, sublinear scaling. Um, however, it has kind of a fatal flaw uh, or a, a fatal consequence or potentially fatal consequence. And that is something that's called a finite time singularity. I'm sure many of you have heard of the term singularity. It's a mathematical term. And it's indicated by that uh, uh, dotted line. And what that says is that these socioeconomic quantities in some finite time in the future, it could be five years, 10 years, 100 years, uh, these quantities are going to go mathematically to infinity, which is crazy. But the theory tells you what happens if you continue with this, it collapses. The system is doomed to collapse. And the question is, how do you get out of it? Well, we know how we got out of it. We've got out of it. And we've got out of it um, in the following way by reckoning this is just a cartoon version um, that uh, here you would be growing in this super exponential way. You'd hit the way, you'd hit the singularity. But you recognize that you're growing within a kind of within this period when a set paradigm you discovered iron you invented bronze you in, discovered coal you invent computers you invent the internet whatever there's some paradigm that sort of sets the cultural and innovative norm and um, but it runs out at some stage and before you reach that singularity you better reinvent yourself you better make a new paradigm shift a new innovation start the clock over again and then you can do the same thing and so you can you can of course then you did another singularity 
And so you have this sequence of singularities and you can sort of derive a theorem, if you like, that if you demand open-ended, unbounded growth, then you have to have cycles of innovation to avoid collapse. Well, most, uh, most of the kind of bullshitty books about businesses and companies say something like this, but what they don't say is you have to do it faster and faster and you have to do it faster and faster in a systematic way. And uh, that's what I've tried to indicate here. And I'm only going to show you one piece of data. This is not mine. Um, but um, here is a proxy for the acceleration of time. It's the time to, to reach 10 million customers of these kinds of innovations. And if you take those numbers in parentheses and plot them, they fit exactly the predictions of this, uh, of this theory. Um, so we have this, this uh, impending singularity getting always closer and closer, but we innovate our way out of it. But um, the question is, time is getting shorter and shorter. And here I've just written out um, what that says. It's just an example of the continuous accelerating pace of socioeconomic life derived from ourselves, from our own social interactions and, and positive uh, feedback in, in um, social and social networks and of course that presents a continuous problem because you have to adapt faster and faster yet we have the same brain and same biology that we had not just 10,000 years ago when we emerged from being hunter-gatherers but from 100,000 uh, you know, or more years ago so that's a major issue which I think we're coming to face more and more and the question is is this sustainable now I'm going to switch very quickly to talk briefly about taking this framework over to companies, uh, <clears throat> and I'll finish up there. So, um, so here's all 35,000 roughly uh, publicly traded companies in the United States from about 1950. This data only goes up to about 2010, but we've extended it to about 2018 or 19. And you see it's this sort of spaghetti mess. Uh, the old, old farty companies are sort of going along uh, very static on the top and the new, uh, the new ones are jumping like hockey sticks down the bottom and it looks like some, again, some sort of random mess with some systematic behavior. But, but extraordinarily under this, just as there is under cities and, and life around you, there's uh, some regularity. And here's the scaling of companies, uh, just a bunch of uh, the metrics for a company and the, the size of a company uh, I've chosen to be the assets, it's total assets, you could take sort of employees, but assets I think is a much better one. Um, and what you see is that they do scale, there's a lot of variance. The color coding here is partially to do with our age and partially to do with different sectors. We've reconstructed this into sectors. But what you also see is that they scale sublinearly. They're much more like organisms than they are like cities, so they, um, have this issue that they're going to grow and relative to the GDP, they're going to stop growing as you saw, and then they're going to die. And I just want to go through that. I want to just write down again, the same kind of equation, the same kind of framework, the company metabolic rate, um, which is of course it's sales. That's what's flowing through. That's what's uh, driving it. But of course the new thing that happens with companies beyond uh, organisms outside of life, which makes it such a powerful entity, is that you can borrow, is that you have this ability to look into the future and borrow from the future, which life, uh, biological life, is not able to do uh, normally. Um, and uh, financing plays a crucial role. And then we have maintenance, which of course is the expenses, and then growth, which is the increase in assets. And you can put this again into a mathematical framework and you can derive. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the growth curve for a company, and I, this is the only equation I put in. <laughs> I couldn't resist, um, but you could derive. And what it, what remarkably comes out of this is that companies do not grow exponentially; they grow following a power law in time with a very large exponent. And you can derive that exponent; it's about six or seven, which means it's growing very rapidly, but not as rapidly as exponential. And that's a problem because the overall market, the sum of everything is exponential and that leads ultimately to mortality. But I just want to show you the data. Again, there's great variance in this because companies, most companies haven't been around very long, uh, whereas biological things where you saw the data very tight have been around a long time. But what you see here is um, uh, that straight line there on the left is the data. 
uh, is the uh, theory, and there's all the data of the 30,000 companies. And on the right, there's just some examples, and you can see several major companies have just followed it. You could predict their growth over a quite a long period of time, and uh, they sort of follow it, meandering around the curve. But the one on the bottom right is one uh, that, of course, we all would recognize, Apple uh, totally outperforming, uh, nevertheless, sort of still following a power law behavior. Um, but um, of course, this gives rise to, you know, ultimately to a marvelous metric for performance of companies, but also, of course, presumably uh, predictive power and making lots of money, possibly. Um, and, and here, just to finish this off, um, I have shown you growth rates, uh, how growth rate decreases with time. If it were exponential, it would stay flat. Growth rates decrease with uh, as companies get bigger. Um, and I'm going to finish up. I'm sorry, I'm going slightly over. Oh, I have a second question. I'm sorry. Yes. That was great, but we'll, we'll, let me just launch that one. Uh, yeah. Jeffrey wanted to ask you all, before we got too far into this, how long do you expect your company or institution to last? 5, 10, 50, 100, uh, forever. Um, as I warned you, Jeffrey, that it's an opinionated or at least it knows its own mind audience. Every, over half the folks have voted. Just give them a few more seconds here. No, no problem. Kick in. That's great. I'm going to close the poll in just a second. Uh, uh, with over three quarters of the audience there. Here we go. And just share those results with you. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, oh, you know, interesting. I'm an optimistic 10 and 50. Well, that's very sensible. Because now I'm going to, and I'm going to discuss now what the data tell us. Let me see if I can go back to my slides. Is that, can you see it? Yeah, we've got the question. Super. Good. Okay. So here's the mortality of companies taking, these are publicly traded companies uh, over the last uh, 70 years. Um, and um, which is the only data we could really lay our hands on. And uh, what you see, I'm just going to focus on the one on the top left corner. Uh, we did, as you see, divide it into death as being either, you know, really death, bankruptcy or liquidation, but also acquisition of mergers. And you see, it's not that different, actually. Um, but um, what you see is that the probability of survival, which is that one in the top left, um, rapidly decreases. And indeed, if you do all the sophisticated statistics, you find that the half-life of um, US publicly traded companies is about 10 years. So even once you've posted on the stock exchange, you, um, you're, you're, you're doing well if you go beyond 10 years. And by the way, lifespan is actually getting shorter for companies in time. Um, and by the way, that, those curves are exponential. They just follow exponential decay, like an atom, like a radioactive atom, which says, ironically, that the probability of death is the same whether you're a relatively new company or a very old company. Strange, uh, strange result. Um, so I'm going to finish off with just two things. Um, I talked about metabolic rate; it plays a central role. Your metabolic rate, sitting there waiting for me for the finish, is about 100 watts, you know, like an incandescent light bulb. Uh, that's all it is. That's 2,000 food calorie day, calories a day, and that's how you evolve um, in, in coevolution with everything else. But now we've gone totally out of whack. Your social metabolic rate, which is how much energy you really need to stay alive uh, today in a, in a sophisticated society, is about 100 times bigger. It's about 10,000 uh, 10, watts, uh, which is extraordinary. And that's equivalent to about uh, being about 30,000 kilogram gorilla. Each one of us is about this size, effectively. That's how we're behaving, or about a dozen elephants. And I'm finishing up with a, uh, uh, just a, uh, a quote from the great John von Neumann, without whom we wouldn't be able to do any of this that we're doing. Uh, the ever accelerating progress of technology gives the appearance of approaching some such essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs, as we know them, could not continue. And he made this prescient remark in 1954. So I'll finish there. And um, I apologize for going a little bit over my time. Jeffrey, no need to apologize. Fascinating. I, I might even extend things by four or five minutes because there's so many good questions here. Let's get cracking. Um, I have to be kind of short and sharp. Um, an interesting question here from Charles Vermont. Now, you talked about this uh, ac acceleration uh, in, in the various stages and phases. So Charles would like to know, does this constant evolution with shortening periods 
morph when the underlying philosophy changes and a new cycle starts? Would the Enlightenment be an example? No, no, I think not in that sense. I mean, yes and no is the answer to that. Um, I mean, every major, every major paradigm shift, or ma every major innovation, um, um, leads to the speeding up of the pace of life. Um, that has happened systematically. Um, uh, however, um, I'm very glad uh, you brought up the Enlightenment because when we think of innovation or even paradigm shift in the last 10 to 20 years, especially. We think of that as technology. We always we sort of it's become almost synonymous. Innovation, the word innovation or even paradigm shift, have almost become synonymous with innovation. And uh, and and the Enlightenment is a fantastic counterexample to that because it shows that you don't have to have an innovation that is technological, may lead to technological innovation, but it's a cultural, social innovation. And that's why in that first poll. I was very pleased to see people seeing that we do need a social cultural revolution uh, because I think the time uh, it, time is shortening, uh, social time is shortening, and biological time is staying the same, and we're getting to a crunch time, and that's what I think is being manifested, by the way, it's speculation in much of the craziness that's going on uh, worldwide in terms of politics and social unrest and so on. But I, but yes. So the answer is sort of yes and no, but I think that's a very important point that we we need another kind of analog to, to the Enlightenment, and it may be what we really need is some um, you know inspired leadership. Okay, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions on uh, civilization. I think we've got a lot of Civilization Six players out here. Um, so John Fullerton is curious: How do we manage civilization in order not to collapse? And Ron Summers jumped in very early on with a, an interesting question. Do you have a view on scaling as applied to the UN Sustainability Development Goals, uh, or more specifically, perhaps on carbon economics? Yes, well, my only uh, yes, I think, well, of course, I'm, I'm very supportive of the, uh, uh, of the UN goals. I think the, I mean, we need something like that, but we need them actually to be carried out. Um, uh, and I, I like them because they also go beyond just, in quotes, focusing on climate change. I mean, climate change is a, obviously a major threat, but what it did not focus on is the fact that I try to emphasize here that it has its origins in us. We're the ones that are doing it, it seems sort of obvious, but also it has its origins in cities. It has its origins in urbanization, and um, also, most importantly, everything is connected with everything else. And if you only focus on one thing, um, you're destined for unintended consequences, and which has been the history in which we've dealt with these problems. So, um, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm very supportive and scaling. The only other aspect I would say um, of the, um, he brought up my the relationship of scale and the kinds of things I'm interested in to, to those goals. Um, I'm disappointed a little bit that um, there hasn't been more um, interest from those that are dealing with this at the political level in actually uh, the this kind of um, grand unified framework of thinking of things in a scientific way. And I think that's been seriously missing. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, we, we need to see develop is in fact um, some um, sort of unified framework um, by bringing together, by programs that bring together scientists, politicians, practitioners, business people together attacking this problem. To, to really recognize it as not as multidisciplinary, multicultural, and based in science. Well, um, we've got a couple of a few people out here. I'll try to weave together three comments questions um, and uh, somewhat apocalyptic, <laughs> if I can. <laughs> uh, you, you know, basically, uh, Aston Brown is curious, what is the maximum human population that the Earth can sustainably support? You know, from your models, is there a maximum population that humanity would grow to, perhaps an S curve tapering off? 
Uh, Shan Turnbull dialing in from Australia, actually. Uh, do you think the plague of people on the planet will be reversed by human means or by natural disasters for humans? And finally, Andrew Ross, who's curious, is biodiversity mass extinction linear? Uh, any quick thoughts on, on those apocalyptic yeah. views? Let's see if I can hold all those in my head together. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I have not really tried to seriously estimate um, the, the, the carrying capacity of the earth. Um, I, I don't, uh, one could, I haven't taken it seriously enough because there are too many unknowns in to in once you get into this, once you get into this picture, um, we start to have, um, you know, there, there's because, because ultimately these questions and, and the other questions that were asked concomitantly, um, in the end, you can do the science, but unless you have buy-in from politicians and practitioners, it's, you know, I'm twiddling my thumbs. Um, or we are twiddling our thumbs. And um, th that's what I said a moment ago. So that's why I, my urging for much more integration of uh, science with policy. Um, and um, so I'm not, I, I, I sort of defer about the carrying capacity. I will say one thing that's sort of uh, related to it. And that is the question of, uh, you know, can you have, uh, you know, how big can cities be? Um, uh, which is a similar kind of question. Um, and that, you know, from in, in this framework, cities are actually open-ended. There's no stopping of cities in terms of the kind of generic framework. However, there is, of course, a practical limit. And what happens, and this is partly of what's happening now, is that when cities get big, um, they start to balkanize because the definition of a city ought to be not just all the buildings that are close together, contiguous with one another, but um, the social network. You are part of a city if you participate in the socioeconomic activity of that city. That's the sort of definition one needs to have. So that, for example, if, if Michael, you are commuting to Birmingham twice a week, you're a citizen of London and Birmingham. And you should be counted as such because you're participating in that socioeconomic activity. Whereas someone living sort of as a, a semi hermit in Hampstead and not doing anything is in some sense less of a citizen. I know that sounds weird, but anyway, you need to define a city, and which is a complicated question. But in that sense, we have this organization, and London is, is to some extent an example of that. But there are cities, I mean, Dallas, Fort Worth is one. Uh, is more more specific, where there are two cities contiguous, but are basically um, uh, independent. I think Graham Elliott anticipated that he had a question here, are conurbations more or less effective than comparably sized cities, yeah. uh, you know, which, which I think is there. Uh, but then, and, let me just say one other thing about that. The other practical thing is, you know, if you tried to make Los Angeles, instead of, uh, you know, 12 million people, uh, 50 million people, you'd have, and you had the same transportation kinds of systems, instead of having 12 lane freeways, you'd have to have 25 lane freeways, and instead of four tracks on the, on the trains and subways, you'd have to have 10 tracks, which is impossible, because you can't make the change that infrastructure. That infrastructure is almost fixed now. And so without great destruction, you can't do it. So there, that's what leads to this um, uh, kind of balkanization. Yeah, Hugh Purser was interested. He said there's been no greater uh, speed of growth in cities and megacities in China. You know, are there any different differences emerging in their model? But I guess you'd say no, really? Well, well, <laughs> there is in the sense that they build them willy nilly. And one of the great criticisms of what's going on in China. So China has this extraordinary problem. It has to urbanize several hundred million people in a very short time. And it's building, you know, two to 300 cities of a million each over the next 20 years, which is gonna affect every single person on this planet. Um, but it's building them at this extraordinary rate where, where, where the cities have become soulless and alien, and it's leading already to serious social problems and will lead to even more. And part of the problem is, and I'm very sympathetic with them, they haven't sort of taken time to really understand what a city is and what a city does and what a city is there for, rather than just putting, bringing all people together in the same way, by the way, 
than London did post-war in clearing the slums after the destruction of the Second World War and built all those council flats, of which I am I have personal experience. Yeah, I live uh, right next to a couple. And, you know, they also cause serious social problems. Um, we've got time for just two quick sets of questions. Uh, one is just just up on the the, the company structure. Uh, Dan Fianney, on any thoughts you might have on do the uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Apple, the, the mega platforms have an expiration date? Um, another one on uh, from Angel Gaviero. Uh, wouldn't it be better perhaps to model cash flow in your corporate stuffs and account as well for dividends and share buybacks and extract energy from mature organizations? Uh, and then I'd like to come on with questions about people. But uh, no, any no, quick no. comments so, on the sorry. Yeah, Thank any you. quick comments on the companies? No, no, the last one to the last question, we've done that actually. We have done that. I presented it. I, I, I decided to present it the way I did without going in, digging deep into questions of, of dividends and all the other bits and pieces that need to go into that. And we do. We we do a cash, we one of the things that we do uh, with this uh, in this framework is we track the cash flow. Uh, as if the cash flow budget as it flows through companies uh, began. And by the way, all the data, just so that everybody knows, comes um, originally from the uh, US tax returns. That's why we can only deal with publicly traded okay. companies. Um, let's see, the, the other question was, let's see, what, did, what was it, the first question? Is about any thoughts on the, 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 you know, the big mega platforms, tech platforms? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I, I, I used to ponder quite a bit, will Silicon Valley sort of violate this? And that's what led me to the question that maybe IT, because we I can sit here and you can be in London, I don't have to come to you to give this talk. Um, you know, maybe that changes things. I don't think so um, on uh, reflection. Um, and I think they're subject to the same things. And I've watched them uh, both uh, from afar and uh, visiting, and I've watched the changes as we see Google go from sort of, uh, you know, in the very earliest days, a kind of cowboy renegade company to looking not much different than, I hate to say it, Ford Motor Company, which I am familiar with, um, except that everybody looks like they've just emerged from the basement of MIT. So that's more to do with dress code, I would say, than anything else. But you know, I don't think, I mean, it, it, I, I don't think there's going to be a fundamental difference. The big question is, how do you make a company more like a city? Cities are open-ended. They allow crazy people. They allow all kinds of weird things to happen. Home, even homeless, horrible to say. But uh, people walking the streets doing loony things so that the rest of us have this extraordinary boundary to expand our ideas and we feel free. London, New York engender the question of you know new ideas entrepreneurship new theaters and so on okay so well, companies don't people like that in a company get sharpened typically yeah. even google yeah the, the importance of serendipity randomness the corporate fool yeah. even you know um That's right. i shouldn't do this but it's such a special occasion for me so i'm gonna i'm gonna do quick up three quick ones if you can address it swiftly yeah. um Basically, Roy Vela, uh, humans are notoriously bad at estimating scale, particularly logarithmic or large numbers. You know, if you can guess a million versus a billion seconds accurately. Any insights as to how to improve that comprehension? Uh, second one uh, from Lawrence Van, uh, Van Wyck, who's I think picking up quite neatly on your bit about the limits of the brain. Uh, would Neuralink technology address some of our future challenges uh, around time and need for innovation? Uh, and very finally, uh, you raised it, the, the kind of uh, the two-dimensional online world uh, from Dan Fianney. How will human society flourish in an ever-increasing online and digital two-dimensional world? And I'm afraid we're going to have to call it quits after you can uh, tidy that yeah, up. Sorry so about that. The first question, just say those questions again. The first was... Um, uh, very bad at estimating scale. Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a difficult, that's a fantastic question, actually. Um, in my book, I actually spent an inordinate amount of time trying to explain what an exponential is, because one of the things I discovered as I got into more and more of this work and interacting with people in the corporate and political world, and even the economic world, is to my shock, 
that most people actually didn't know what an exponential was, even though they used it consistently in their conversations and by saying, you know, oh, we're going exponentially fast. Well, you better look out then. I mean, rather than saying we've we've tried. So, um, So I try to explain that, and I think that's an incredibly challenging question to somehow get across what an exponential is, both it's uh, why it's fantastic at the beginning to be exponentially expanding, but why it's incredibly dangerous if you continue with it, or could be potentially dangerous. In the same way, the question of what a logarith- what logarithmic means, which is the inverse of it. Uh, so I don't, and I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any great ideas. I did in the book, I focus entirely on exponential in this context, and I, I brought up a couple of wonderful examples, I think, um, uh, uh, of uh, one way of understanding the consequences of exponential and what an exponential does. I mean, the simplicity of doubling, ever just continually doubling, is so alien to us, and it sounds so simplistic. And and the idea that that's going to lead to a black hole is is uh, is is not something that comes along with sort of quote common sense. So I'm sorry, I don't have anything. But if you if you take a moment and read that little section in my book, it might give some little insight, at least as far as exponential is concerned. The second question was... Uh, just quickly, anything on Neuralink technology expanding? Yeah, no, that's very good too. Um, yes, I didn't say that, but obviously, you know, who in the hell knows? Um, if we become cyborgs, if we link up, uh, you know, I mean, after all, what I'm doing now is an extension of my brain. Clearly, it happens to be outside of me, um, and we're going to have more and more of that. Um, obviously, uh, and uh, some may be actually connected to us. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical myself, but um, you know, one, one has to leave the door open for those fantastic sort of science fiction possibilities. Um, but um, the, the, my big concern is that yes, those might be possible, and in fact, that may in the longer term be probable. But we don't have time. Time is the thing that's squeezing us. That's the biggest issue for, as far as I'm concerned. Time is contracting. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, um, solar time, uh, astronomical time, by which the clock goes and we're running out of it, um, is, um, it stays the same. And so yeah. that it, we get full. But socioeconomic time is continually speeding up. And sadly, that is a good point at which to draw lines. Uh, which... <laughs> We are running out of time or have run out. Uh, I think Dan's question about society and the digital two dimensional though is actually somewhat related. I, 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 we said, we... I did talk about that briefly. And um, my, as I say, I've gone back and forth on that. In fact, originally when I was developing some of this, I thought, oh, gee whiz, fantastic. Serendipitously and fortunately, um, you know, we've invented IT, the internet and digital technology and so on. And that is going to get us out of this horrible dilemma that, that we're facing. Namely, our very success is leading to our demise. This is one way that we're going to get out of it. But on reflection, I've actually changed my mind. I don't think it's going to make any difference. It just speeds things up. In the same way, the two major inventions of the 19th century, which were actually much had a much bigger impact than the internet, namely the steam railway, which shortened distances, from, you know, everybody lived their life within 10 mile, 20 mile radius. Now you have the globe. I mean, no, well, in, for a steam engine, you have the entire country um, and more, even more so the telephone. Um, letters would take days, even weeks sometimes, and suddenly you had instantaneous connection. Well, th- those were more revolutionary than the internet. And yet what they did was speed everything up. The fundamentals did not change. Well, I hope that everybody, Jeffrey, has come away uh, as I as I did 20 years ago with the importance of scale is much underappreciated. Uh, and in fact, you know, as you're also right, uh, exponential is just an adjective people toss around and they don't really think through the implications. Um, sadly, though, I have to give three quick rounds of thanks. One as ever to our sponsors. I hope that you've enjoyed this and see why it's such an important issue. Uh, secondly, to you, the audience, you've been as vibrant as ever. And yes, I will be sending all of your questions with your emails to Jeffrey in case he wants to respond to anything directly. Uh, we do, as ever, have a fascinating program. Why should I read it out? You can see it here and check it out online. But but please do uh, do so. 
Jeffrey, um, there, there, we could have we could have gone on forever, and I would like to at some point, uh, but we don't have forever. Uh, but thank you so much for dialing in. Thank you for so much for such preparation. It was so kind of you to share your thoughts with a, a financial and technology audience uh, outside of the scientific realm that you often inhabit. I know you connect with many realms, obviously with scale, but it was so kind of you to come over here and share all of your thinking with us. I really, truly do appreciate it. Unfortunately, uh, the technology is two-dimensional, Dan, uh, and I am unable to open the floodgates of applause, uh, but I do have my Korean karmic clapper, which I use <laughs> as a substitute. Thank uh, you. Well, for the audience. Well, Very thank you. Important. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for inviting me, and I enjoyed doing this, and uh, I'm just sorry I couldn't see the audience and be there. I so much prefer that, as we all do, and I really miss that, now, frankly. I really miss it terribly. But thank you. Thank you for, for everybody for attending. So, great. And I look forward to reconnecting with you later, Michael. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye.